thank you, Samir. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you on some issues of uh, fiscal federalism, uh, which is the subject of today's uh, panel discussion. I'm somewhat hesitant to do so because uh, only four days ago, I spoke rather extensively on this very subject at the LKJH Memorial Lecture organized by the Reserve Bank of India when uh, I dealt with some of the suggestions uh, of how to strengthen the fiscal architecture of this country. Now, I think Alok was not too wrong when he said that the fiscal architecture of the country has worked reasonably well in terms of what the constitutional provisions have been and that the, those issues which constitute the deficits, the gaps in terms of resource uh, equalization with responsibilities and the symmetrical action is by mechanisms which the Constitution itself has, has defined. Now, I think that since we are familiar with that territory, I'm going to make uh, just four uh, brief observations. First and foremost is that the Constitution, as we all know, has divided, broadly speaking, the governance architecture into uh, three categories, which is outlined in the seventh schedule of the Constitution. I want to dwell a bit on this. The seventh schedule of the Constitution, as we all know, has three lists. A list one, which deals with the responsibilities of the union government. A list two, which are the responsibilities of the state government. And a list three, which deals with the concurrent list of subjects, which are the responsibilities of both the union and the states. Except that in the event of any conflict, the legislation passed by the union government shall take precedence over any legislation passed by any of the state governments. What has the history of our fiscal federalism so far demonstrated? It has so far demonstrated, in my view, that these lists, which were drawn up at the time of the Constitution, have to some extent proved malleable and have proved somewhat impractical. It has proved impractical right from the beginning because from the inception of the Planning Commission, many subjects which are in the domain of states were taken up by way of the use of Article 282 of the Constitution in the category of centrally sponsored schemes. These are some iconic ones like Gromo Food Program, the Bhakra Nangal Dam, and so on and so forth. But progressively, over a period of time, there is a marked incongruity in the Article 282 of the Constitution and the seventh schedule of the Constitution. Now, what is this Article 282 of the Constitution? The Article 282 is not a core provision of the Constitution. It is a residuary miscellaneous provision which says that notwithstanding any of the demarcation in any of the lists which have been given, the central government or the state government may choose to give a grant for any particular initiative or activity which is in the overall interest of the development of the state. Now, it is this Article 282 of the Constitution under which the Planning Commission, which has since been abolished, has so far created a whole plethora of centrally sponsored schemes. Now, what are these centrally sponsored schemes? The centrally sponsored schemes cover subjects which are well into this, the list two of the state governments. They cover wide range of activities. They cover subjects which should be in the domain of the states, except that the fact that this original sin was not started recently. This original sin was started in the first five-year plan itself, and since then, this sin has got increasingly more and more accentuated. And fiscal romantics, who feel deeply committed to the fact that these are subjects in the domain of states, should have spoken up when any time this, any of the centrally sponsored schemes related to issues which are purely in the domain of the states. 
So what has happened over time is there have been three other connected phenomena. First and foremost, that Parliament has over a period of time enacted standalone legislations or what I call entitlement-driven legislations, which gives Parliament and gives a legislation the backing of, the legis of an act enacted over and above what may be the demarcation of subjects in the seventh schedule of the Constitution. What are these? Right to work, the Manrega one, right to food, right to employment, and these are stand-alone legislations even though prima facie employment, food security, and education are subjects which are purely in the domain of the states. These standalone legislations and how they legally mesh with the original architecture of the Constitution is an area where I think that the last word is yet to be said. Along with this, the second development was, as we know, the increased enlargement of the list of subjects in list three, namely the concurrent list of the seventh schedule, in which many subjects which are in the state list got transferred to the subject of the concurrent list from the state list, like for instance, uh, like for family planning, uh, economic, uh, the issues of environment, e issues of ecology, are subjects which got transferred from the state list to the concurrent list. All this has been happening over a period of time. What is the outcome today? The outcome today is that if you look at the drawing board, you'll find it a very cluttered drawing board. You'll find as many as perhaps 115 centrally sponsored schemes, notwithstanding many rationalization attempts which were made, the last one being under the committee headed by Shivraj Singh Chauhan, who headed a committee on rationalization of centrally sponsored schemes in which they had three categories. You had the core, the core of the core, and the optional. Now, these are nice, uh, but under each of these, the centrally sponsored schemes have continued to dominate the scene. So much so that as far as the union government is concerned, every year, the union government spends 3.53 lakh crores on these centrally sponsored schemes, an equivalent amount perhaps by the states. So the total amount which may be sent, spent on centrally sponsored schemes, since it's not a 50-50 sharing ratio, I cannot just multiply by the double, but somewhere in the region of about 6 to 6.5 lakh crores per annum is spent on these centrally sponsored schemes between the union government and the state governments. Now if you look at the subjects, which are in the centrally sponsored schemes, they are largely subjects which are originally and predominantly in the domain of the states. Therefore, any model on fiscal architecture must reckon the fact that it is now a cluttered drawing board. We need to revisit this drawing board in a holistic way. And in fact, I'm not saying this uh, just because the thought has just struck me, I was reading through the literature of this, a very eminent economist, Raja Mannar, who was also connected in the Finance Commission, as the chairman of the Finance Commission. Raja Mannar had headed a committee way back in 1971 when he said that an eminent group should be constituted, consist, consisting of jurists, economists, and those engaged in policy making to revisit list one, list two, and list three. I subscribe to that view. So my first big broad suggestion is that the seventh schedule of the Constitution, as originally defined, has ceased to serve the purpose which was intended. Because over a period of time, this has become malleable and become increasingly unrecognizable. It is time that we understand this contemporary reality. And by the way, do you think it is practical that if the Prime Minister of India were to visit Haryana, which is a next door state, and he happens to visit a Haryana district, and he wants to do something on drinking water, or on power, or on health, he'll be reminded that you can't do so because this is a subject which is in list two, 
and is in the domain of the states. So I think technology, migration, and pressures which have taken place have wiped out the significance of a neat classification of subjects between list one, list two, and list three. And the sooner we come to terms with this altered reality, the better would the, and more realistic would be the fiscal architecture which you want to have for the growth of the country. My second broad suggestion is that successive attempts to rationalize the centrally sponsored schemes have met with limited success because of the fact that more and more seem to be get added, less and less seems to go away from the drawing board. We need to revisit the core centrally sponsored schemes on eight or nine clearly nationally defined priorities, have patterns of funding which are predictable and which are certain. State governments often have complained to me that a centrally sponsored scheme may begin with a sharing ratio of 75 by the central government, 25 by the states, but over a period of time, this gets dramatically altered. And once they are in a centrally sponsored schemes, it is very difficult for them to get out of these schemes because they have got used to it. There's a whole lot of establishment and bureaucratic structure which gets, which gets really embedded in this, true of the union government, true of the state government. So I think my second suggestion would be to have a holistic visit of, uh, of all these centrally sponsored schemes. To see it also in the context of central outlay schemes, many chief ministers have suggested to us that the central outlays, which are purely centrally funded, and the bulk of the central outlays fortunately happen to be in the areas of defense, happen to be in the area of internal security, happen to be in the area of railways, which are core subjects in list one of the central government. But I think we need to see the symmetry between central outlays and centrally sponsored schemes to improve the multiplier effects and optimize the multiplier gains. My fourth and last suggestion is that since the GST was a far-reaching, iconic reform of part 12 of the Constitution relating to the sharing and of, re of the resources, which are both in the center and the states, the GST is indeed a very radical tax reform. And indeed, the government of Narendra Modi under his leadership, with, uh, under the huge amount of impetus which it got with the negotiating capability of late Mr. Jaitley and carried forward by the present uh, finance minister, did achieve the virtual impossible that what countries took decades to have a GST, India did it in a record time. Of course, it is nobody's case that this is the perfect GST, but this is a very robust beginning which really augurs well in terms of India having one common market with one common uh, taxation on uh, goods and services. But I think that uh, clearly there are attempts which are underway, and I would encourage these attempts of how to improve the compliance on the cost of compliance, on the onerousness of compliance, on the predictability at which rates are determined, and in the manner in which the GST is being administered for the benefit of all stakeholders, which will really therefore enable the original objectives of the GST to be fully realized. But when I say this, let it not be misunderstood. When many critics have said that the GST is a failure, it's certainly not a failure. It is, in my view, an outstanding attempt to bring about a radical change in the architecture of taxation, which is going to have, and which will have, many multiplier gains in terms of having the simplicity of the tax structure. But having praised the GST, it does not mean, really, that it is not time for us to look at the kind of improvements on the kind of areas with, on which I have briefly touched upon. But to the extent that the part 12 of the Constitution has been radically changed in terms of the taxation structure by the constitutional amendment which led to the GST, uh, should not put us in the complacency that there is need for constant improvement and for constant refinement as, as, it, as we go along. My last point, really, and I'll be very quick on this one, 
is something that Alok touched upon, the institutional changes which are necessary to be able to have uh, a consultative mechanism between the center and the states. What should be an ideal consultative mechanism? Now, I think that we have, of course, the National Development Council. We have the Council on Center-State Relations. We have the Niti Aayog. And occasionally, every five years, you have the Finance Commission. We need to see how each of these institutions become more robust to impart greater dynamism in a consultative mechanism between the center and the states. Let me conclude by saying that the fiscal architecture of India had withstood the test of time over the last 70, 72 years. This architecture has only got strengthened, but like in most countries, fiscal federalism is not a dead concept written in stone and not subject to changes. I think we need to be mindful of the fact that given the fact that technology, migration, increasing interdependence, not merely of India becoming a part of a, a global value-added chain, but are becoming an India value-added chain, which involves interdependent states, we need to revisit some of these subjects with a fresh mind. Thank you very much.